Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. You want to open your heart to the Lord tonight. That the Bible study will enrich your life. Will make you to understand the dealings of God with man. Of the saint, of the sinner, of the believer, of the unbeliever, of the righteous, of the unrighteous. That you'll see tonight the writing of God in the book. And at your heart, or rejoice as you learn what the Lord has for us today. Please open your mouth and pray to the Lord. That this time in the presence of the Lord will be a great and rich time, a profitable time, precious in the sight of the Lord. Precious in your Christian experience. Leading you to know the Lord more than ever before. Prayer God will help us as a church to grow to maturity as we come week after week. Monday after Monday, studying the Word, that the Word will have a place, conspicuous place in your heart. Will bend your will, subdue your heart, break steepness and stubbornness in the heart, and make you live a life. That is pleasing unto the Lord. Pray that the Lord will drive the darkness of ignorance away. And will bring in the light of his word. And that light of the word will shine brightly in your pathway. And so will God help you to live such a life. And people that see you and know you, they will take knowledge that you have been of the Lord at his feet, studying the word. Pray that God will make this place the gate of heaven for you. To direct your thoughts toward heaven. To turn your heart, your mind towards heaven. That God, through this word, applied by the Spirit, will make you heavenly minded, spiritual, not worldly minded, earthly minded, carnal. That God will shape on your life, sharpen your life, shape your life, sharpen you up. Make you vigilant, Sober, dedicated, committed, serious before the Lord. And pray that your heart will have a burden for those who do not know the Lord. And the zeal of the Lord will consume you. So that with passion, with zeal, with earnestness, you'll go out, touch other people's lives, 
turn them from darkness to light. From sin to the Savior to righteousness. So that the promise of the Lord, the day that turn many to righteousness, shall shine as the firmament of heaven and as the stars forever and ever, that that promise will be yours. And then the Lord says, he's writing a book of remembrance for the people that believe him, that love him, that fear him, that respect him, that honor him. Reverence him. Who speak to one another day by day. A book of remembrance reaching concerning them. And the Lord says, I would hold them and keep them like jewels. Precious. They shall be mine. In the day when he brings judgment. Upon those who do not know the Lord, who do not fear the Lord, who do not honor the Lord, who do not reverence the Lord, who do not love the Lord, on the day when he judges them, those people that love the Lord and his word, he'll put them in a special place. Pray that Lord, that the Lord will count you worthy. Worthy of such special privilege. To be counted precious, peculiar treasure of the Lord. Pray that you'll be a disciple indeed. A disciple is a learner. Like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Hearing his word. Learning the word. Listening to the word. Allowing the word to work effectually. In our heart. Pray that you'll be like those believers. In Thessalonica and in Berea, who daily searched the world, learning and believing what they learn, knowing this is the word inspired of the Lord. That this word will be so precious to you. You not look at it as common, ordinary, as special and precious. Pray that tonight the Lord will open your ears and open your heart, turn you around, teach you to transform you. Tell the Lord, Lord, that which I see not, teach thou me. And if I have offended, if I've gone astray, if I've done any iniquity, Lord, I will do it no more. As for the grace to live a righteous, pure, holy life that you can present to the Lord as a sacrifice of sweet smelling odor. Acceptable to the Lord, edifying to the church. 
rewardable in your own life. Pray that you'll not just be a learner of the word, you'll be a teacher of the word. That God will grant you that privilege, that ministry of a teacher. That your life will teach. Your words will teach. God will give you the ministry. The ministry of an effective, effectual teacher of the word that will lead many people out of darkness into the glorious light of the true gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We are always grateful that you keep us alive to see a day like this. Thank you, Lord, because you brought us together, united in heart, to come and study your word and to hear, thus says the Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray tonight as we reveal your mind, your word, your will unto every one of us. We'll open our hearts and we'll receive your word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the heart of unbelief that will reject your word, you take that heart away from us. And a kind of attitude that will sift your word and accept this and reject the other one, making ourselves judges of the Almighty God, that blasphemous attitude take away from us in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to hear what you say, to learn what you teach, and to allow the world to turn our lives around so that we'll be the kind of people, believers, we ought to be in Jesus' name. Teach your people tonight and let the teaching of your word benefit and profit everyone. And make us not just learners, not just hearers, but doers and teachers of the word in Jesus' name. I will pray that many souls will be turned to the Lord through your children, our brothers and sisters, our boys and girls, in Jesus' name. Keep us awake as we study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4. And tonight we're looking at verses 33 and 34. I told you the other week that we have had already a panoramic study of the chapter. That is chapter 4. We've gone all through from verse 1. And we've gone to verse 37. But there are some things that are very important hidden in this chapter. That if we do not look at it, you might not have the privilege of looking at it any other time or for a long time. That's why we're taking our time. And after all, the Lord has given us the word so that we can benefit thereby. I pray that the study tonight will benefit and profit every one of us in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4 verses 33 and 34. The same hour was the sin fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his ears were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the day, Sir Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Those are the verses we're looking at tonight. You'll find in verse 33, the same hour was a thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. What was that? That was fulfilled upon him. 
he had had a dream. And he saw this big, great, tall tree that was so high unto the heavens, having leaves and fruits and a lot of shade. And in all the buds of the air came to dwell, came to take shelter under that tree. And then there was a voice from heaven, the voice of an heavenly messenger sent by the Almighty God, cut down the tree, but leave the stem, the storm. Until seven seasons or seven times or seven years will pass over the tree, the storm, and then it will grow again. And then he couldn't understand. It troubled him. He called all the soothsayers and the Chaldeans and the wise men of Babylon. They couldn't understand. They couldn't interpret. Eventually, Daniel came. Daniel had the Spirit of God. And because he had the Holy Ghost within him, he knew the interpretation of that dream. And he said, Thou art the tree. This will happen to you. You'll be dethroned. You'll be deposed. And then you'll be sent away for seven seasons, seven times, seven years. And you'll eat grass like oxen. The dew of heaven will fall upon you. You'll just live with the animals. And the heart of an animal will be given unto you. Until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Until you know that man is nothing. And God is the Almighty, the Most High. Until you know that, that chastisement, that punishment will continue. And then eventually it said, the same hour the sin was fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. If you look at your outline, you'll see the purpose and effect of divine chastisement. Underline that word, divine, divine, divine. Can I tell you, Daniel did not chastise Nebuchadnezzar. God did. Do you remember? Moses did not chastise Pharaoh. God did. That's divine. Moses did not chastise Miriam. God did. Do you remember? It was not Samuel that chastised Saul. God did. You will not forget, Nathan came to David. And he said, thou art the man. He had sinned. Chastisement came. Nathan did not chastise David. God did. Do you remember Ahab? Ahab was a terrible man, a sinful man, a wicked man. Because he sold himself to doing evil. Because his wife was the counselor telling him to do evil. And then Elijah came to him. Judgment came, punishment came, chastisement came. But it was not Elijah that chastised Ahab. God did. Do you remember Acts of the Apostles chapter 12? Peter came out of the prison. In that same chapter, Herod that put him in prison. He gave an oration, a speech, and the people said, This is the voice of God. He did not give the glory to God. An angel came from heaven and smote him right. The divine chastisement, and he died, and worms came out of him. Peter did not chastise Herod. God did. I'm telling you tonight, there's a kind of chastisement, terrible chastisement, not coming from man, not coming from a pastor, not coming from, not coming from a worker, not coming from any of our leaders, coming from God directly from heaven, divine chastisement. What's the purpose? What's the effect of such chastisement? This strange punishment was a severe punishment. It sustained chastisement seven years passing over him the divine chastisement or divine discipline was administered in love love for nebuchadnezzar's dying never dying soul and love for all the people and the nations and the languages that dwell in all the earth who will hear who will fear and who will turn to god for forgiveness mercy and salvation that's the reason the chastisement came upon him he should have known that when God said that, and Daniel, the man of God, counseled him, commanded him, O king, break off your sin and break off your iniquity. Repent, turn around, and so that iniquity will not be your ruin. He just brushed that aside. He didn't know what will come. 
And then the first month, second month, until the eleventh month, nothing happened. And he would have thought God has forgotten. No, God doesn't forget. He's the one that made, created the brain. He doesn't forget. He's the one that created the eyes he can see. And he's the one that created the ears he can hear. He's the one that created the mind he can think. He never forgets. The twelve months, that man, Nebuchadnezzar, he had forgotten the message. He had forgotten the word. All of a sudden, he began to boast and to and to and to and to declare his own majesty to brag. He said, "It's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty." While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, "O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken." The kingdom is departed from thee. That was the challenge. That's how he became mad. And that's how the chastisement came upon him. But please remember, the Lord brought the chastisement not because he hated him. He wanted to redeem him, help him. He wanted to get him out of his sin into a righteous life. Now the question is, is the chastisement of the Lord limited to his children? Is the chastisement of the Lord limited to believers only? No. Does he, does he love the sinner enough to chastise him so as to recover him from the path of sin and ruin and eternal damnation? God's love is toward all, towards the saints and towards the sinners as well. That's why if you turn your Bible to Psalm 94, Psalm 94, you'll see that God chastises the heathen also. Not just the believers, not just his own children. He loves all these creatures, even the sinners. And if they're going so far in sin, he'll bring chastisement unto, upon them so as to bring them back from the way of evil. In Psalm 94, 94 verse 10. He that chastises the heathen, the pagan, the idol worshiper, the sinner, the worldly man, he that chastises the heathen shall not he correct? He that teaches man knowledge shall he not know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. He's talking about unbelievers and yet he chastises them. In verse 12, blessed is the man whom the Lord chastise, chastineth, O Lord, and teaches him out of thy law that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity. That's the purpose. That thou mayest give him rest. Out of the days of adversity. And then it says, until the pit digged for the wicked. We're looking at, um, you're looking at uh, Job chapter 33. You'll see the plan of God and the purpose of God. Why he brings the chastisement upon the sinner, upon the backslider, upon any of his children going astray, going the way of the world. In Job chapter 33. I'm reading from verse 16, Job 33, verse 16, Then he openeth the ears of men, not just believers, only of men in general. And it says, and sealeth their instruction, that she may withdraw man from his purpose. That's the reason for chastisement. Man has a wrong motive, a sinful purpose. A damnable purpose. And God wants to withdraw the man out of that purpose. From that purpose. Because of that, he brings chastisement upon him. And hide pride from man. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had a lot of pride in the heart. Pride sat on the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. And God wanted to take that pride away. He wanted to separate the pride from the man and the man from the pride. How would he do that? By the chastisement that he brought upon him. In verse 18, he keep it back his soul from the pit. And his life from perishing by the sword. He chastiseth also with 
pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with pain with strong pain so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat his flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen and his bones that were not seen stick out yea his soul draweth near unto the grave and his life to the to the destroyers if there be a messenger with him an interpreter one among a thousand to show man unto man his uprightness then he is gracious unto him he saith deliver him from going down to the pit i have found a ransom his flesh shall be fresher than a child's and he shall return to the days of his youth he shall pray unto god and he will be favorable unto him that's what chastisement does divine chastisement we're not talking about man's chastisement we're talking about the chastisement that god himself brings upon a man upon a woman upon a creature of his creation because of his sin and he wants to tell that man you're going too far and you're going on in sin if you continue like that you'll perish forever you'll suffer forever and forever and because he doesn't want the man to suffer eternally he brings the temporary punishment and chastisement upon him so that he will withdraw or retrieve his soul from the pit and then it says in verse 26 he shall see his face with joy for he will rain down to man his righteousness as we look at the study tonight we're going to divide to three parts number one proper response to divine chastisement there's a way to respond to divine chastisement and then number two punishable refusal of divine chastisement there are people that will reject refuse get to sin cast out any thought of that divine chastisement and then it's more terrible for them number three positive results of divine chastisement we're coming back to number one number one proper response to divine chastisement we're looking at daniel chapter four verses 33 and 34 daniel chapter 4 33 the same hour was a sin fulfilled upon the Kadnezer. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his ears were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days, at the end of the seven times that passed over him, at the end of the seven years that passed over him, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. He lifted up his eyes not to look at what he had built in babylon now not to look at the things on earth not to look at his riches not to look at his uh, property he lifted up his eyes unto heaven and then my understanding returned unto me and then he said i bless the most high i praised and honored him that liveth forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation proper response is the result of proper understanding. You see, I read it to you already. As Nebuchadnezzar said, my understanding returned unto me. And also he said, my reason returned unto me. He came to know that the root, the root of all his sins was pride. He knew that the purpose of God's chastisement on him was to make him realize that those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Look at verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, think about this. It is, it is a total change, a total transformation, a total turning around. He was no more like he used to be. The divine chastisement had a purposeful effect and impact upon his life. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride tell me the rest is able to abase those that walk in pride the almighty god 
is able to abase. He now understood. Look at verse 35. Look at the lesson he learned. Verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He thought he was somebody. He was a great king. And his uh, counselors, his captains, his cabinet, and all those princes who also bow, always bow down to him. O king, live forever. They thought it was all in all. And he himself, when he saw that great tree and big tree that was as high as heaven, and Daniel said, thou art that tree. He felt it was great and big. But now he said, I've learned my lesson. He said, divine chastisement had made me to know who I am, has cut me down to my normal size. Now he said, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his stand or say unto him, what doest Thou. That's the lesson we ought to learn, and that's the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar learned. You see, without proper understanding and without proper response, divine chastisement will not have been of lasting benefit to that man, Nebuchadnezzar. His proper response led him to, number one, repentance. Number two, led him to righteousness. Number three, led him to reconciliation with God. He said, now, I love God. I fear God. I reverence God. I honor God. I extol God. I exalt Him. And I'm praising His name. The proper response granted him restoration to his earthly heritage as well as the hope of an everlasting inheritance. His proper response prevented is dying under divine chastisement and going to a lost eternity. He could have died under that chastisement, died in sin, died in rebellion, died fighting against God, but no, he turned around. He said, my understanding came back to me. My reasoning came back to me. Now I know who God is and I know how small I am. And he reconciled with God. And he published that, publicized that all over. And he said, I want everybody to praise the Lord and to fear this God in heaven. is all in all. It's the most high. And all men are reputed as nothing. And that means then when you have that idea, that understanding, when you're under any divine chastisement, under divine rebuke and divine punishment and divine discipline, and then you turn around and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I know that I've done wrong. And you submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. That's where you're going to benefit from that divine chastisement. You know, there are times that God brings chastisement upon us because he's rebuking us for sin. He's rebuking us for secret fault or presumptuous sin. And a proper response should be what is written in Job chapter 34. Look at that. Job chapter 34. Four verses thirty one and thirty two. Job chapter thirty four. Verse thirty one. Surely it is meet, it is fit, it is suitable to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I didn't fight chastisement. I didn't reject the chastisement. I didn't complain or grumble on the chastisement. I have born chastisement in verse 31. And then it says, I will not offend anymore. That's the right attitude. When God has rebuked a man, corrected a man, when God has chastised a man or a woman for sin, he says, I've borne it. I've accepted it. I know I was wrong. I will offend no more. Verse 32, that which I see not, Teach thou me. During that chastisement period, that's what to say to the Lord. That's what to be praying. That's the prayer to be praying. You know, sometimes when God is rebuking somebody and you ask the person, say, are you praying? Well, I'm praying. What are you praying for? I'm praying that God will restore me to what I used to do. That's not the prayer. What's the prayer? That which I see not, teach thou me. God knows me more than I know myself. He knows my heart. He knows my thoughts. He knows my secrets more than I know. He can 
put a better interpretation on all my actions than I can put on those uh, the interpretation I can put on those actions. And because of that's why you are praying, oh Lord, that which I see not teach thou me. And if I have done iniquity, what's the rest of the sentence? I will do no more. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. The soul that has come to know the Lord. Reconciliation of the Lord. Restoration unto the Lord. Righteousness in the Lord. Because he has turned away from sin, he has repented. He does not continue in those evil things. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. And that's the attitude of all the other children of God, all the other people of God, that God corrected, chastised, and punished, and disciplined because of their sin, because of their evil. In Second Chronicles chapter 33, Second Chronicles chapter 33, we're reading from verse 9. We're looking at a man called Manasseh. And we're looking at how he lived and what he did and why chastisement came upon him. Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, to go astray. He wasn't satisfied to only sin personally, only sin as an individual, only disregard the Lord, disobey the Lord, dishonor the Lord as an individual. He made other people to sin. He influenced other people to sin. He taught other people to sin. He led other people to sin. It says, This Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen, whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they will not hack him. The Lord sent prophets, preachers, to tell them the word of the Lord and to remind them that God is a holy God. Therefore, you shall be holy because I'm holy. But they rejected everything. In verse 11, it says, Wherefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. When he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him and was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. He had a proper response to the chastisement that the Lord brought upon him. He knew that God used those heathens to take him captive and to put that punishment pain upon his life. In Psalm 78, Psalm 78, I'm reading from verse 30. Psalm 78, verse 30. Yeah, it tells us in verse 30, they were not estranged from their lost. But while the meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them. They are not even finished. The meat was still in their mouths. And the wrath of God, the anger of God, the indignation of God, the punishment from on high came upon them. That's chastisement. That's discipline. Divine discipline. Divine chastisement. And then he tells us in verse 31, And he slew the fattest of them, and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this the sin still, and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore they are Days did he consume in vanity, and their years in trouble when he slew them, when he punished them, when he chastised them, when he disciplined them, then they sought him and they returned to inquire early after God. That's what the Lord wants that chastisement to produce in our lives. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I'm reading to you from verse 67. Psalm 119, verse 67. It's telling us here in verse 67, it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. I was living a carefree life, a careless life, a backsliding life. 
A useless, worthless life. Before I was afflicted, before the chastisement came, I was just thinking, I'll see if you know I cannot backslide. I'm saved and saved forever. And even if temptation comes, I thought I was going to stand. And the man was living a careless, a carefree, a sinful life, a frivolous life. He said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. The chastisement came upon him. Divine chastisement, divine discipline. And he says, but now after that discipline, things are different now. Verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Don't pity me, you said. And don't think it was a bad thing. It has done a good work in my life. It says it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. In verse 75, it says, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. He said, this is not man. He wasn't looking at any man doing this to him. He said, I know thou hast afflicted me. What's the purpose of that? So that you could learn righteousness. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. And I'm reading to you from verse 8. Isaiah 26. We're looking at verse 8. It says, Yea, in the way of thy judgment, so Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. When the chastisement, the punishment, the rebuke, the divine correction, when it is upon the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. That's the purpose, and that's what God wants to achieve whenever he brings chastisement upon any man, upon any woman. Before I leave point one, I'm going to ask you a question. What kind of repentance does God require when somebody is under divine chastisement? What kind of response? Is it a temporary thing or a permanent thing? You see, there are some people, when God brings heavy chastisement upon them, at that moment, because of the pressure and the pain, and because of the terrible affliction they are going through, and because of the heat of that affliction upon them, or oh, they say, oh, Lord, I repent, I repent, and then after the, after the punishment is gone, then they go back into it again, and God brings a greater, heavier punishment on them. Let me show you. In First Kings, I'm looking at chapter 21. First Kings, chapter 21. As you look at verse 27, and it came to pass when Ahab had those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah and the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me because he humbleth himself before me? I will not bring the evil in his day. But in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. When Elijah told Ahab and he said, Now divine chastisement is coming upon you. You've gone so far to do this again. You've killed Naboth and you have taken the vineyard. Now you are going to see the heavy hand of God. All of a sudden, Ahab realized I'm in deep trouble. And then he went softly. He appeared to repent. And God said, Elijah, look at Ahab of all people. He has repented. He has turned. I will not bring the punishment in his day. And then when Ahab realized that, Punishment is gone. Chastisement is gone. And God has said, I lift it up. No problem again. See what he did in chapter 22. The very next chapter, verse 6. Then the king of Israel, that's Ahab, gathered the prophets together. About 400 men. 
and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. These were false prophets. God just forgave the man. And God just lifted up the discipline. And God removed the divine chastisement upon him. And the very next chapter, he gathered 400 false prophets together. Look at verse 7. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imla, by, by, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. You see that? I hate him. That man, he preaches straight. He doesn't uh, use uh, any kind of methodology that will suit what he says. I hate him, for he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. That's the man that God had forgiven in chapter 21. And he said, judgment is gone. Divine chastisement no more. And now you are free. God has forgiven you. There will be no evil in your days. All right, if I am free. The very next chapter, 400 false prophets that began to prophesy unto him. Look at verse 23. In verse 23, Now therefore behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord has spoken, what is that? Tell me out loud. Concerning who? Concerning thee. This man that God said, all right, no evil. I've taken the evil away. Because he repented and was walking softly. And he said, Elijah, you saw me. I've done that. I will do no more. And God said, Elijah, go and tell him, I forgive him. I remove the divine chastisement. And in the very next chapter, he changed. And then got all these false prophets together. And then the Lord sent another prophet and said, Now he has spoken evil concerning you. What did he do? Did he repent now? No, he was going to use methods now. And look at the method he tried tried to use. Verse Verse 34. In verse 30, it says, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself. Self-management now came in. No more repentance. This man, you see that, there's some people like that. They've gone through divine chastisement. And during that time when the pressure was on them, they pray and they say, Lord, if I come out of this, I'm not going to do evil anymore. And then the very next month, the very next chapter, the very next year, they go into evil. And they go into something they've done before that wasn't good. Wasn't what they not the false prophets that Elijah destroyed? Yes, he destroyed those false prophets. And this man, after the forgiveness, after the restoration, he gathered the false prophets again. He gathered other ones. And I said, I'm going to be disguising myself now, so when I do evil, then no hand will catch me. Look at verse 34. In, in verse 34, here it says, And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of and of the anise. Wherefore he said unto the driver of the chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the hose, for I am wounded. Look at verse 37. It says, So the king died and was brought to Samaria. And they buried the king in Samaria. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria. And the dogs leaked up is blood, and they washed the armor according unto the word of the Lord, which is spake. The forgiveness was reversed, was removed, was cancelled. The evil that had been prophesied, that evil was still fulfilled because it was a temporary repentance. And let's look at Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. When the chastisement comes, sometimes divine chastisement. There are some people who say, I repent, I repent, I repent. I will not do that again. And after the discipline is gone, the chastisement is lifted. They go right back into evil. Exodus chapter 9. I'm reading verse 27. And Pharaoh sent and called for 
Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have seen this time the Lord is righteous and I and my people are wicked. What else do you expect? That's repentance. That's turning away. That's confession. And that's saying, I realize it now. I've done wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I and my people are wicked. We're, we're terrible. And, and God is great and God is righteous. And then as you read on, that divine chastisement was taken away. After it was taken away, look at verse 34. In verse 34, and Pharaoh, when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder was ceased, he sinned yet more and had in his heart he and his servants. You see that? This is a man that said, I have sinned. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. And now after that, he went right back into that same thing. I'm looking at Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, we're looking at verse 7. Judges chapter 3, verse 7. In Judges chapter 3 verse 7, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Bealim and the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Chushan Rish. Richard Tame, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served him eight years and when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord the Lord raised up a deliverer unto the children of Israel who delivered them even Othniel the son of Kenaz Caleb's younger brother here we're told of these children of Israel they did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord sent them into bondage and when they had that divine chastisement upon them, they cried unto the Lord. And the Lord delivered them. After the deliverance, what happened? Did they remain serious, saved, sanctified, selfless, and serving the Lord in all sincerity? Look at verse 12. And the children of Israel did evil. What's the next word? Tell me. Again, again, again. They were chastised before. They were punished before. There was divine discipline upon them before. And when they felt the heat and the weight and the load and the pressure of that divine chastisement, they repented and they called upon the Lord. And after being released from that chastisement, see what happened again. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Egnon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Well, what you learn from the action of God is, God never says, all right, I'm fed up. I disciplined you the first time, and then you, you repented, I restored you. You've done it again, all right? Do whatever you want to do. Not God. He brought another punishment on them, chastisement upon them again. And when he brought this divine chastisement upon them, look at verse 15. In verse 15, we are told, but the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. The Lord raised up a deliverer. And then another deliverer came again and delivered them. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. And the children of Israel, what's the next word? Again, tell me. Again did evil in the sight of the Lord. And you see all these people, they the sinned and God brought chastisement. Then they repented. And then after the repentance and God released them and everything was alright, they forgot themselves now. And he did evil again. But you want to understand the actions of God. God is never tired. If he wants to take a man to heaven, if he says, I love you. Because I love you, I want you to get to heaven. He is not going to allow the man to remain in sin. And so he disciplined them. They repented. Then they went back into sin. Then he brought the chastisement again. Because he is after the correction, after the righteous, after the purity and the holiness. And then they cried again. He released them. They sinned again. He brought the chastisement again. Look at verse 2. And the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain, the captain, 
uh, the captain of whose host was Sarah, which dwelt in Harosheth, and of the Gentiles, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. You see, they kept on crying unto the Lord whenever the chastisement came upon them. Judges chapter 10. In Judges chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 6. Judges chapter 10, verse 6. And the children of Israel, tell me the rest. Judges chapter 6, verse, uh, chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 6. Have, I, have you opened the place? Okay. And the children of Israel, tell me the rest. Did they will again in the sight of the Lord. Look at these people falling and rising, falling and rising, falling and rising. They were never able to walk straight. They didn't have that righteousness that was consistent. The discipline came now, and then you see them another year. Brother, I've not been seen for some time. Well, I'm in it, I'm in it again. What do you mean? I've done it again, and you know, they will not let me alone because they love me so much. And the Lord is using the leadership. It's the Lord doing it, but the Lord is using the leadership to say, no, you can't do that. You can't go your way. If you're going to get to heaven, you must be holy and righteous in a consistent way. That's why the Lord was bringing it upon them all the time. And then it says in verse 7, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, into the hands of the children of Ammon. Well, we have learned that when chastisement comes, and if we really want to be free from divine chastisement, the repentance must be thorough, must be genuine, must be permanent, and must be consistent. We must live a consistent life in righteousness. After that, chastisement. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two, punishable refusal of divine chastisement. Punishable refusal of divine chastisement. Well, there are some people, they don't even pretend to repent at all. They are chastised by the Lord. They are disciplined by the Lord. And then they just continue to say, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to turn around. I'm going to show that I don't care what God does. And such people might die under divine chastisement. And then if you die under divine chastisement, God is unhappy with somebody. God is angry with somebody. God's wrath and indignation is upon somebody. And he dies in that condition. That that means that the person is going to stay away from the Lord forever and ever. That means the person is going to miss heaven if he dies under divine chastisement because of refusal to repent, refusal to turn around when the hand of the Lord was heavy upon him. Isaiah chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah chapter 9, we're looking at verse 13. For the people turned not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush. In one day, the ancient and the honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of these people cause them to err, to go astray. And they that are led of them are destroyed. It tells us there are some of these people, when they come under divine rebuke, correction, chastisement, they remain adamant in sin. Let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 28. Second Chronicles chapter 28. See another example. Chapter 28 verse 22. And in the time of his distress... Did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that king Ahaz. He was trespassing against the Lord. And the Lord said, I'll bring you back. I'll correct you. I'll chastise you. Divine chastisement came upon him. And it says, in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? That he is this King Ahaz. Then it says, For his sacrifice unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him, and he said, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them that 
they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And then in verse 24, and he has gathered together the vessel of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem and in every several city of Judah he made high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. Even though he was chastised, yet he will not repent. Jeremiah chapter 5. In Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading verses 3 and 4. Jeremiah 5, verses 3 and 4. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou was tricking them, but they have not grieved. He chastised them. He punished them. He corrected them. He laid a severe punishment upon them, but they said, I don't care. I don't mind that. I can bear that. I can stand that. That's what they were saying to God. And then it says, And they, were, they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Now do you think, do you ever think, can you ever think for a moment that God will say, well, I want them to get to heaven and... I've corrected them. I've chastised them. I want them to be pure so that they can be partakers of his holiness and they remain adamant in sin. Will God say, all right, if it's like that, I'll still take you to heaven anyhow. Will God do that? Never. Never. God will not be the loser. Before you were ever created, God was happy in heaven. And if you miss heaven, God will remain happy in heaven. He has myriads of angels, millions and trillions and innumerable angels worshipping him. And he has saints from the time of Noah until the time of the rapture that will be worshipping him. If God corrects you for sin, for evil, and he wants you to turn away from sin, and it brings the divine chastisement upon you. And you say, no, I will not budge. I'm going to keep on fighting against God. and fighting against righteousness and holiness. The Lord is going to abandon you. It's not going to say, I am tired. He's the ancient of days. He's the eternal God. He's the everlasting God. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's not going to get tired because that man is not tired in living in sin. He keeps on in sin. The man, if he dies in that condition, he'll be surprised. He'll find himself in hell. That's why it says in verse 4, Therefore I say, surely these are poor, they are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I pray God will help us. Uh, look at Daniel again. I'm going to read Revelation, but before I read Revelation, I want you to see something in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4, I'm reading verse 34. It says, at the end of the days, at the end of that divine chastisement, at the, at the end of that punishment, at the end of the days, I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I, what's the word? Tell me out loud. Blessed, blessed, I bless the most high. That's what the Lord is expecting. But you know, there are people, they don't bless, they curse, they blaspheme. When God brings chastisement upon them, they complain, they murmur, they curse, they blaspheme, they speak contrary to the word of the Lord and to the nature of the Lord. And they have bitterness against God and the people of God in their hearts. Let's look at Revelation now and see such people. Revelation chapter 9. In Revelation chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 19. Revelation chapter 9, verse 19. For their power is in their mouths and in their tails. This were a kind of demonic scorpions that, uh, that were stinging the people. For their tails were like, the, were like unto serpents and at heads and with them they did, did they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. 
when those uh, uh, various uh, areas or kinds of chastisements came upon them, they didn't repent, they didn't turn, they didn't understand that much more was waiting ahead of them. And it says that they should not worship devils or an idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their sex. They just went on in sin. Judgment came, chastisement came, punishment came, rebuke came, divine correction came. That didn't change them. They just continued. In Revelation chapter 16, Revelation chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 8. Revelation 16, verse 8, And the fourth angel poured out his veil upon the sun, and the power, and power was given unto them to scorch the men with fire, and the men were scorched with great heat. That's chastisement, that's punishment, they because of their sin, and they blasphemed the name of God. God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, when the chastisement came upon him, he said, My understanding returned to me, my reasoning returned unto me, and I blessed the most high God. In the case of these people, it says they blasphemed the Lord, neither did they repent of their evil. I want you to look at Verse, uh, in verse, uh, verse 21, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent, and the men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, and the plague thereof was exceeding great. They blasphemed. Instead of blessing God, instead of saying, Lord, we are sorry. You know, there are some people like that. They don't understand when we talk about divine chastisement. They think it's, you know, just, uh, why did you stand there? Why did you sit down there? They think that's what we call divine chastisement. When divine chastisement comes, it's terrible. I want to show you something in the Word of God. The agents of divine chastisement. The agents of divine chastisement. And there was uh, one man long ago, uh, you know, he was, he was fond of going to church. And then he will go to church and when the word of God says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he'll, kneel, he'll be shouting and praying, oh Lord, humble me, oh Lord, humble me, oh Lord, humble me. Eventually the pastor of that church, after he got fed up hearing him kneeling down like that every time, oh God, humble me. And so he went to him and said, brother, why are you praying like this? God said, humble yourself. And if you humble yourself in sight of the Lord, he'll lift you up. Don't pray that kind of prayer again. Humble me. If God humbles you, by the time he finishes with you, there will be nothing else remaining. Humble yourself. Don't go, don't, don't go to God and say, God, humble me. And, you know, there are some people that will say, that will go to God and say, God, chastise me. God, chastise me. Those are babies. They don't understand what they are saying. If God, if God will chastise you, by the way, why will God chastise you if you are living righteous? If you are living holy? If you are living a sanctified life? If you are living a pure life? How will God just, you know, see you that you are living righteous and holy and sanctified? And you are living according to the word of God. And he says, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. And then he begins to chastise that individual. No! It means you are a secret sinner. It means you are a stubborn sinner. It means you are a deliberate sinner. And then you are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, I've done that thing you said I shouldn't do. All right, chastise me now. If God chastises you, nothing will remain at the end of it. Be very careful. I'm going to show you now. The agents of divine chastisement. The agents of divine chastisement. Number one, divine direct power divine direct power that God himself does it. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel, I'm reading to you from chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 12. 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 12. Go and say unto David, 
Thus says the Lord, I offer these three things. Choose thee, one of them, that I may do it, that I, this is direct. This is the Almighty God Himself saying, David, you have sinned. You have done evil. You have done what you shouldn't have done. Now, I'm going to chastise you. I'm going to give you a choice. I'm going to give you three alternatives of my agents. And so, God came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of farming come upon, come unto thee in thy land? That's divine chastisement. Poverty. Farming. Nothing to eat, no job, total scarcity, in the midst of plenty, that's divine chastisement. Or, will thou flee three months before thine enemies, while they pursue thee, that's another kind of chastisement. God said, choose one, either I will leave you in farming, I'm going to make you to be running from your enemies for all these months, or then now number three, or let or that there be three days pestilence in thy land. Now advise and see what answer I shall return unto him that sent me. And David said unto God, I'm in a great strait. I'm confused. Let me let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. Number one, agent. God's direct divine power in divine chastisement. Number two, he uses angels, angels in divine chastisement. We're looking at Psalm 78, verse 49. Psalm 78, verse 49. These are the ages that God uses in divine chastisement. It says in verse 49, he casts upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Do you see when somebody is saying, oh God, chastise me, oh God, chastise me, and he doesn't know the agents of chastisement. And then of this anger and wrath and ignition and trouble will come and then an evil angel comes that's demon coming on that individual because he invited that to himself either because he's living in sin or he's just careless or he's saying oh god i'm here they, they say you chastise people come and chastise me let me see and if you talk to god like that you know god he'll teach you a lesson that's why you should be very careful how you pray and how you talk and you understand that god is almighty you cannot just say whatever you want hey, the agent number two the angels of god it says in some 35 some 35 Psalm 35, I'm reading from verse 6. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. That's chastisement. If a man persecutes you, know how terrible it is. When an angel of the Lord persecutes a man, a woman, how can you bear that? That's another agent in, pers- in, uh, in um, chastisement. Number three now, men. Men. And this is terrible. Wicked men of the earth is an agent of chastisement. You know, some people, they don't understand. They think that chastisement just means, you know, one leader in the church rising up and said, okay, don't, don't, don't sing anymore. I don't uh, walk anymore. Don't preach anymore. That's what they call chastisement. That's nothing. We're talking about divine chastisement. And God says he can use men as agents of such chastisement. We're looking at Second Samuel chapter 7 second samuel chapter 7 we're looking at verse 14 second samuel chapter 7 verse 14 i will be his father and he shall be my son if he commit iniquity i will chasten i will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men that's another agent of chastisement that God will leave the man in the hands of the wicked and the rod of men and the stripes of men will be laid on that man until that man will turn and repent and say Lord now I know that this is terrible I cannot bear this number four enemies 
when the Lord wants to chastise him, and he has a lot of methods, a lot of ways, he brings divine chastisement upon somebody. He can deliver that person into the hands of enemies. That's number four. Number one is God's direct power chastising the man. Number two, evil angels persecuting the person. Number three, men, the rod of men and the stripes of men. Number four now, enemies in Judges chapter two. Judges chapter two. I'm reading from verse 14 and verse 15. Judges chapter two. Verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. That's divine chastisement. He sold them. He abandoned them into the hands of their enemies. Verse 15, Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them. And they were greatly distressed, being left or being abandoned into the hands of enemies. That's divine chastisement. Number five, the Lord uses the beasts of the forests. The beasts of the field to bring chastisement upon people. Second Kings chapter 17. Divine chastisements. What are the agents? The agents, number one, God's direct power. Number two, evil angels persecuting, oppressing, harassing, afflicting the person. Number three, the rods and the stripes of men. Number four, the enemies. The person is sold into the hands of enemies. Number five, the beasts of the field. Second Kings chapter 17. I'm reading verse 9. Then I will go to verse 25. And the children of Israel did secretly those things which that were not right against the Lord their God. They did secretly, secretly, secret sin. And they say, well, I will not indulge in sin, but once in a while I will commit sin. The Bible says, whosoever is born of God does not do what? Tell me out loud. Does not commit sin. Does it say, whosoever is born of God does not indulge in sin? Does the Bible say that? Tell me out loud. No. The Bible says, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And if somebody goes into sin secretly, is committing sin secretly, and he says, nobody will know this. Don't tell anybody this thing we're doing together. Don't allow anybody to know this. Hey, this divine chastisement. The, the one you are trying to avoid is nothing. The divine chastisement is a terrible thing. And the Lord can use the beasts of the field. Look at verse 25 now. Verse 25. So it was at the beginning. It was at the beginning of the dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord did what? Who sent the lions? Was that Satan? No, this is God. Some people don't understand. Many calamities happening to those who are living in secret sin. Many, many troubles and many things that are happening to them, nothing is working out. And they don't understand that this is divine chastisement because God has a lot of agents to fulfill His way in bringing chastisement upon somebody. It says, and it was, and, and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord, therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Number six, famine and pestilence. Famine and pestilence. Nothing to eat. Just poverty. That, that God sends as divine chastisement. If the Lord has sent Jesus Christ to die for you on the cross, and the Lord is pleading, turn away from sin. Why will sin be your ruin? Come, repent and turn and be saved. I want to save you. I'm preparing a place for you in heaven. And you love your sin more than the Savior. I will say, no. That thing you have said by the word of the Lord, we will not do it. 
We're going to do whatever we want to do. Jeremiah chapter 44. Divine chastisement. Jeremiah chapter 44. I'm going to read first of all from verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouths. That's deliberate sin. That's with a hardened heart. That's with a seared conscience. Whatever you preach, whatever you say, we want to tell you face to face, we're not going to obey the word of God. Now look at the chastisement and look at the agent of divine chastisement in verse 13. Verse 13, for I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt. As I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, that's the agent of divine chastisement, by the farming, that's the agent of divine chastisement, and by the pestilence, by the pestilence. You see, God has a lot of ways. Now, another scene, number seven, natural disaster, natural disaster that God uses as a means, as an agent of divine chastisement. Jonah, I'm reading chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tashish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. Tell me the beginning of verse 4. In unison, one, two, three, go. Thank you very much. But the Lord said, the Lord was watching him. He rose up and said, I'm going to run away from the presence of the Lord. That thing God wants me to do, no way. I'm not going to do that. Go to Nineveh and go and preach to those people yet 40 days. And Nineveh shall be overthrown. I will not do what God wants. I have another plan. I have another agenda. I have another program. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to obey the Lord. And then he went his own way and God followed him. And God allowed him to enter into the ship, into the boat. Everything was fine. The weather was clear. And the sea was calm. And the mariners were all taking all the records and registering people. Everything was all right. Now when they shut the door and they got onto the sea, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the sheep was like to be broken it's divine chastisement god has a lot of agents a lot of things he can do and eventually they cast lots and they said who is who is the cause of all this and the man said i know i am the cause this is divine chastisement now what are you going to do repent no Turn to the Lord. No. What are you going to do? Just don't worry about Cast me to the sea. I'd rather die than repent. Do you know there are people that are so steep necked like that? So stubborn like that? That will say, storm. I'll fight it out. You, I, I, I'm pitching you that you are in the storm with me. I'm the cause. But cast me to the sea. I don't care what happens. Let's see now. We're looking at a verse. Uh, we're looking at verse 15. In verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. The people really knew this man was under divine chastisement. Now the Lord in verse 17 had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Chapter 2. Then Jonah uh -huh. you know, how can you fight with God and win? God will catch you. He will catch up with you. And you're still saying, still saying, no, I will not. Whatever God wants to do, let him go ahead. Wait, God has a lot of agents that he uses in divine chastisement until he bows down the mind and the heart and the will and the breaks the backbone of the man. 
And in chapter 2, verse 1, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, is God out of the fish's belly? And he said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floors compassed me about, all the billows, all thy billows, and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy side. Yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The waters compass me about even to the soul. And the death closed me round about. And the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with a bars was about me forever. Yet Hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God? When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe thine vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. He had to come to that. He said, Lord, as a prophet, I know what I consecrated. I know what I vowed. And I deviated from that vow of the prophet. Now, Lord, it's enough. Please, please, let it stop in this place now. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. The point is, God has a lot of agents. A lot of agents for divine chastisement. First, first uh, Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 5. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan. This is terrible. We've been talking about God's direct power chastising a man. We've been talking about the evil angel persecuting a man. We've been talking about the stripes and the rod of men. We've been talking about being sold into the hands of enemies. We've talked about the lion, and the beast, and then the famine and the pestilence. Then we've spoken about natural disaster. Now Satan allowed to oppress the man, afflict the man, torture the man, an agent of divine chastisement to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So when Satan torments the individual in divine chastisement, then eventually he says, Lord, I surrender. I cannot continue to resist your power. Again, in First Timothy chapter 1 verse 20. First Timothy chapter 1. I'm looking at verse 20. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, divine chastisement, abandoned unto Satan. That is, they just said, is out of the church, it's out of the protection of Calvary, it's out of the protection of the blood of the Lamb. And now he's out in the world there, and Satan is the god of the world. And Paul the apostle said, divine chastisement is not going to be a farming, it's going to be a lion, it's not going to be an evil angel, it's not going to be another thing. This is going to be Satan directly. It says, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that she may learn not to blaspheme. That's the reason why when God is rebuking a man, rebuking a woman in a very slight way, in a very very moderate way. Before it comes to all these other things, let the purpose of that divine chastisement be fulfilled. What's the purpose? The purpose of divine chastisement is to lead man to repentance. Is to bring man into fellowship with God. He desires not only a present fellowship, but an eternal fellowship with all his creatures. If the word of his love fails to bring us to him, he will send the rod of his love. He will not give up until we hear the rod. We listen to the chastisement, to the voice of that rebuke. And then we give ourselves to the We're looking at Micah chapter 6 verse 9. Micah chapter 6 verse 9. And see what the Lord is saying. Pay attention to the discipline. Pay attention to the divine chastisement. Micah chapter 6 verse 9. The Lord's voice cries unto the city. 
and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, hear ye the rod, listen to the message of the chastisement, hear ye the rod, and who has appointed it. We'll come to point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at positive results of divine chastisement. Positive results of divine chastisement. In Daniel chapter four, I'm reading from verse 34, the positive results that the chastisement had upon Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4 verse 34. And at the end of the day, I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the most high, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. I come back to verse 1, from verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people and nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought each good to show the signs and the wonders that the high God has wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. He was praising the name of the Lord because now he's gone through the whole scene, the divine chastisement and now he wants to write everything down for the teaching, for the learning, for the inspiration of other people so that other people will not tread the path of sinfulness that he had trod. He tells us in verse 30, seven. Now I Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. He says now, I wasn't doing this before. That's why the chastisement came. I was careless before. That's why the chastisement came. I belittled the Lord before. That's why chastisement came. I disregarded the Lord before. That's why chastisement came. I didn't care. I didn't worry about. I wasn't concerned about the demand of God before. I just did what I wanted to do in my pride. That's why affliction came. But now you said, after the affliction. Now, I Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. That's what chastisement should produce. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26 reading from verse 14. If they shall confess their iniquity, and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, that's what the Lord wants the chastisement to accomplish in our lives. When God has laid his heavy hand, heavy hand of divine chastisement upon anybody, he says, if the uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, if they accept the punishment, if they don't murmur, they don't complain, they don't grumble, and they don't put the blame on other people or put the blame on God, if they accept the punishment of the iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember? And I will remember the land. We're looking at Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5, what it in from verse 17. When there's repentance and there's restoration to the Lord, then the Lord will remove the heavy chastisement that is put in upon the backslider, upon the sin upon the one that is sinning presumptuously or secretly and the favor of the Lord will come upon that person once again. Job chapter 5 verse 17. Job 5 verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. 
Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty, for he maketh sore and pindeth up. He wandeth and his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. Yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. In famine he shall redeem thee from death and in war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shall thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. That is, if you take the lesson to heart, if you do not despise, reject, complain, gain, say, and talk contrary, and act contrary to the chastening rod of the Lord. It says, if you humble yourself, it says if you repent of your sin, it says if you are totally restored unto the Lord, if you're not Take the word of God as precious unto you. And you live in righteousness and holiness. When you have felt the chastening rod of the Lord. He says then he will restore you. And then he will bring the heritage of the children of God. He will bring that heritage upon your life. And he says if he, in farming he shall redeem thee from death. And in war from the power of the sword. In verse 21. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shall thou be afraid of destruction when he cometh in verse 22 at destruction and famine thou shalt laugh neither shall there that shall thou be afraid of the beasts of the field it's telling us in proverbs chapter 3 verse 11 proverbs chapter 3 we're looking at verse 11 and verse 12 when god corrects us he wants us to bend to bow to yield to the correcting hand of the lord he wants us to say oh lord i'm sorry for what i've done and then to yield obedience allegiance loyalty faithfulness unto the lord after he has brought that divine chastisement in proverbs chapter 3 verse 11 and verse 12 my son despise not the chastening of the lord neither be weary of his correction for whom the lord loveth he correcteth even as a father the son whom in whom he delighted. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12, and you'll find that same message there. Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord, tell me the word, loveth whom the lord loveth he chastineth whom the lord loveth he chastineth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth if ye endure chastening god dealeth with you as with sons for what son is he whom the father chastineth not but if he be without chastisement if he be without chastisement Whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. It says, those are candidates for hell. They don't have any relationship with God. If God just says, leave him alone. Don't touch them. If frame is joined unto idols, leave her alone. It's gone beyond the day of grace. It's gone beyond the possibility of restoration. It's gone beyond redemption and salvation. Leave him alone. Let him have his time here. Then he'll face the consequence in eternity. That's terrible. That's terrible. If a man, if a woman gets to the point where, you know, he says, the people, nobody can talk to me now. Nobody can touch me. They know. They know that whatever I do, I just do. You are not a son in the family. That's a bastard. Look at it. That's the word of God. In verse 8. But if he be without correction, without chastisement, without rebuke, if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we give them reverence, respect, and honor. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily are earthly parents, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, 
that we might be partakers of his holiness now no chastisement no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby wherefore if you're under that divine chastisement lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed verse 25 see that you refuse not him that speaketh You've done evil, you've committed secret sin, you've done what you shouldn't have done, and there's divine chastisement upon your life. Don't just neglect that. Do not shrug it off and say, I don't care. You will care. If you don't care here on earth, you'll care in eternity. When hell fire becomes your portion, see then that she refuses not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaking, as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken might remain wherefore we receiving a kingdom I pray you'll be in that kingdom we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear read verse 29 Won't you go Once again, for the last time, for our God is a consuming fire. It's talking to believers because it says, wherefore we receiving a kingdom. It's talking to children of God. And it's it's saying children of God, don't be careless, don't be frivolous. Don't just commit sin just like that and feel that there's no consequence to that. And don't say there's no punishment even though I do whatever I want to do. It says we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. It says let us have grace. Those are believers. And then it says whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence, with honor, with fear, with godly fear. Because our God is a consuming fire. After he dealt with Nebuchadnezzar, and he was through with Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar bent low before the Lord. He said, now things are different. I extol, I exalt, I praise the God of heaven. We shouldn't wait. He shouldn't have waited for 12 months. At the time when Daniel told him, he was, it was like at the Bible study with Daniel, and Daniel said, amend your way, repent and turn. If he had done that at that time, all the this will not come. Don't wait too long. Tonight, the Lord wants to forgive. And the Lord wants to restore. And the Lord wants to cleanse. And the Lord wants to bless. Don't wait for another 12 months. Don't allow the experience of Nebuchadnezzar to come upon you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And let this message of the word of his love have effect and impact in your life. Then the rod will not have to come. If the rod has come already, then you tell the Lord, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then that repentance will bring restoration. Talk to the Lord in prayer. God is not an indulgent father. God is not somebody that will say whatever people do, whatever, wherever people go, whatever sin they commit. Well, I don't want to touch anybody anymore. God, God is not like that. There's punishment for the sinner. There's, there's chastisement for the backslider. And Nebuchadnezzar saw the other edge of the sword. It was terrible. Don't wait for that. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I have heard. I have learned. I've seen it myself in your word. A holy God, a righteous God, a pure God. Or purer eyes than to behold iniquity. 
And you are not going to excuse man, especially a believer, studying the Bible every week, going through all these pages of scripture, still committing secret sin. The agents of divine chastisement, there are many. You want to repent and you want to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Nothing secret again. No secret sin anymore. No presumptuous sin anymore. No evil anymore. All those sins I've done in days of carelessness. Lord, I repent. Lord, I yield myself unto you. I surrender my heart unto you. I have borne chastisement. If I've done evil, Lord, I will do no more. Surely, it is right to be said unto the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. And don't let your confession be like that of Pharaoh. Like that of Ahab. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you're walking gently and walking softly for one day, for one week, for one month. After one month, you forget yourself. Let the holiness be permanent and consistent. Let the righteous walk and the pure life be a consistent life. That God will know a work of grace has been done in your heart. There's full restoration. And there's full restitution. And there's full reconciliation. And there's real righteousness in your life. A total change. Visible change. Demonstrable change. That all the people will see. And it glorify your Father who is in heaven. Pray that God will bring so, such a change in your life. If Nebuchadnezzar of all people, Nebuchadnezzar of all people could change. You don't want Nebuchadnezzar to beat you to it to go ahead of you. In eternity, if you don't change, if you don't, if you don't give your heart to the Lord, and if you don't allow yourself to be humble before the Lord, if you don't allow the work of grace to be done in your heart, in eternity, Nebuchadnezzar will condemn you. You hold the Bible in your hand. You study the Bible every week. And you hear all these words. If there's any hidden sin, any secret sin, I'll see continue. And after the Bible study, you still go back into that secret scene or the same partner. The secret stealing, secret adultery, secret fornication. And the evil. And you still continue. After going through such references of the Bible, knowing that God it's not going to excuse any sin on anyone. It's no respect of persons. Call upon the Lord. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And then he says, and the Lord will pardon. The Lord will forgive. And after the Lord has forgiven you. And the rod of chastisement has been removed. You don't want to continue again like Ahab, like Saul, like Pharaoh, going back into the same scene or another kind of scene, careless life, sinful life, defiled life. God is a merciful God. He forgives. He saves. He cleanses. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. After that cleansing, let holiness continue. Let righteousness continue. Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson. And he learned that lesson permanently. Learn it to you. And follow the Lord in holiness of life, righteousness in your life, purity of heart, 
so that the favor of God will continue your life now and continue throughout eternity. Then when you die, you'll be sure you're going to be in eternal fellowship with the Almighty God. When the rapture takes place anytime, you'll be happy you'll know that you're going to be part of the saints as the saints go marching in. You'll be there. Think about your eternity. Live with eternity in view. Don't play with hell. Don't play with divine chastisement. Don't wait for an evil angel to torment you and persecute you. Don't wait for the lions of the world to devour you. Don't wait for the famine and the scarcity and the poverty. Don't wait. For the rod of men and the stripes of men, agents of divine chastisement, don't wait for the manifestation of divine power from on high to bring you down to the level of the dust before you then repent. Make this time while the Lord is calling, while the Lord is pleading, while the Lord is speaking to you like a father. Come back to the Lord. And our children, our young people, you are hearing this. God is no respect of persons. Children of pastors, children of Christian leaders, children of believing parents. The parents are bringing you up in the way of the Lord. If you yield to the pressure of your classmates and your age mates and you refuse to listen, you don't want to wait until the Lord reduces you to dust and ashes before you turn, before you repent. Repent today. Call upon the Lord and then he will have mercy upon you. And except you repent, you shall likewise suffer under divine chastisement. Repentance, turning away from sin, breaking the yoke and breaking the covenant with all those agents of darkness, coming to the Lord fully, having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you on the cross of Calvary and saying, I give my heart to Christ. I give myself completely, surrender, submit myself completely unto Christ. That's what will lift the hand of judgment and divine chastisement away from you. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your skins be as scarlet, it shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, you will wash them as white as snow. Then he says, if ye be willing and you obedient, he shall eat the good of them. But if he refuse, like Nebuchadnezzar, if you refuse for those 12 months, he shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has said it. Don't wait. Repent today or gently. Call upon the Lord. The Lord will receive you. After coming to the Lord, stay permanently with the Lord. So that the blessings of the Lord will continue in your life.